We're continuing our sampling of the teachings of Jesus. In our last presentation, we looked at the parables of the kingdom in Matthew 13. And of course, before that, we looked at the Sermon on the Mount. In this lesson, we'll take just two samples from the Gospel of Luke. And then in the next uh, session, we'll look at one long sermon in the Gospel of John. The teachings of Jesus from the book of Luke that we'll concentrate on are very familiar stories that Jesus told. We want to look at them in context. We want to make sure we know the, the meaning. In Luke chapter 10, we'll read the story of the Good Samaritan. And in Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son and two associated stories about a lost sheep and a lost coin how little we're able to cover in our limited time. The Gospels offer so many more lessons. We're covering in Luke just these two sermons, these two lessons. There's so much more to learn. Just as an example uh, to encourage you in your future further study of the Gospels. In uh, his book, the Way According to Luke, Paul Borgman has included this fascinating chart about lessons that are repeated in the beginning and the end of the Gospel of Luke. Notice, for example, that the first lesson that he presents is from chapters 9 and 10 uh, on the theme of peace to this house, which he parallels to a passage and the nearer the end of the book in chapters 18 and 19 about the things that make for peace. Then more strikingly similar as he numbers it 2a in chapter 10 you read about what must I do to inherit eternal life and then again you see at the bottom 2b in chapter 18 again you look at what must I do to inherit eternal life and if you'll notice there is a sequence, kind of comes to a point in chapter 13 on uh, what to do to be saved, and moves back covering very much similar topics in reverse order. I just present that uh, chart to you to bring to your attention how much more there is to study. We're just going to cover Luke 10 and Luke 15. You know the story of the Good Samaritan. Remember, to place it in context, we start out not with the story, but with a conversation that Jesus has with an expert on Jewish law. So we pick up reading in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So this is a person that's an expert on the law of Moses. He doesn't know if he trusts Jesus to be a good teacher. So he asks him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replies with a question. What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he, that is the expert in Jewish law, answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he, Jesus, said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So pick up these points for the context of the story of the Good Samaritan. The exchange starts off with the two agreeing on the most essential and important elements of the law, to completely love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus commends 
this man for giving the right answer. But he puts in a little bit of a challenge when he says, do this and you will live, implying perhaps that the legal expert uh, was not doing this. That seems to be implied by the uh, question that he asked of Jesus, perhaps as a rhetorical question, uh, hoping to draw attention away to, uh, to his uh, perhaps guilt of neglect. And he asked him, who is my neighbor? That's when Jesus tells about the Good Samaritan. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Understand it's a rugged trail to walk down uh, a steep uh, hill from uh, Jerusalem down to Jericho. And it, it's likely that this unnamed, unidentified man uh, was in a very remote area and subject to mistreatment by these um, villains, who uh, these robbers, who not only robbed him, but stripped him and beat him and left him half dead. Picking up then in verse 31 through 33, there's going to be a clear contrast here. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. The priest and the Levite occupy exalted positions in Jewish society. They are the ones who can work at the temple, the only ones who can work inside the temple. They are seen as an epitome of, of pious uh, Jewish religion. But Jesus exposes that sometimes those in public positions assumed to be pious can have hard hearts. So not one, but two people in such positions see a beat up dying man on the side of the road and just step aside not to have to get near him. In contrast, a Samaritan walks by. You're familiar already with the tension between Jews and Samaritans. They had a bad history and Jews look down on Samaritans. Jesus is making an obvious point when he speaks of a Samaritan taking pity on the man. Here's what he does, verse 33. The Samaritan came to where he was, saw him, had compassion, Having compassion is evidently something that the priest and the Levite did not do. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. He did all that he could do and more than might be expected. So Jesus takes that story and turns it back on the person who is trying to justify himself by saying, who is my neighbor? After telling the story, Jesus says, according to verse 36, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. 
with that beautiful story, Jesus is somewhat putting in his place or improving the understanding of someone who knew what was most important to God. At least he knew what the scripture was, but evidently needed to put into practice what he knew was right about neighborly love. Moving on to Luke chapter 15. These are some of the most familiar passages in Luke, and I'm, I'm sure that you uh, are quite familiar with them. Again, Jesus is dealing with people who've come to challenge him, to uh, try and perhaps make him look bad. Uh, chapter 15, in the first couple of verses, is the situation which leads to telling these stories. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So the Pharisees, the strictest um, denomination of Jews of the day, and the scribes, those who meticulously kept the records, are complaining about Jesus. They are um, appalled that he would spend his time with bad people. He even would share meals with them. Jesus responds with three stories. Beginning in chapter 15, verse 3. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, doesn't leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. So without directly answering their criticism of his spending time and socializing with sinners, he tells them in a way that they can't miss the point unless they want to miss the point. That it's more important when one is lost, when a sinner is lost, to go to the lost one than it is to close yourself in with however many there are who are saved. He tells a similar story in verses 8 through 10. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin that I'd lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. We've all dropped something valuable. I remember once doing yard work and I didn't know it, but I dropped my wedding ring. It had fallen off into a bag of old leaves. In the middle of the night, I woke up and realized I didn't have my wedding ring on. And, I, and as soon as it was daylight, I went out and I went, you know, leaf by leaf through the, through the uh, garbage bag until I found my wedding ring. And I was so delighted, so relieved. I was like the woman who had found her silver coin. 
when Jesus, again, clearly states that he's talking about the importance of finding sinners and bringing spiritual joy in getting one sinner to repent. 